For over a decade, hundreds of British-born Muslims have traveled to Syria and elsewhere in the name of Jihad. At the same time, we've also been fighting a battle against violent extremism here in London. The most recent terrorist attacks have seen five people injured and two killed. I know a lot about counter-extremism and counter-terrorism work because I've been on both sides of the fence. I was once considered a violent extremist myself. As an emotionally charged and concerned man, in 2002, I embarked on a journey to Afghanistan. I went in my mind to alleviate the suffering of the innocent women and children who were caught up in this unfair war. I realized how much of a mistake I'd made when I found myself amongst Al-Qaeda who were urging me to take up arms. I returned home determined to stop others from making the same mistake as I did. I launched the Active Change Foundation, a charity focused on stopping young people being groomed by extremists and de-radicalizing those convicted of terror acts. Adil, not his real name, is a former violent extremist who spent four years in prison for carrying out an arson attack related to his ideological beliefs. I started a fire in the home of someone who at the time I believed was blasphemous. But since his early release from prison on the condition he underwent de-radicalization and mentoring processes with me, Adil has rejected violence. I am still a passionate believer in Islam, but my understanding of faith has changed. I used to think that victims of terror attacks were just collateral damage. I now believe all human life is sacred. I think what changed things for me, Hanif, was meeting you, having someone show an interest in me. No one had ever done that before. Just simple things like eating with you, going to the mosque together, that one-to-one -one contact. In the early days, I felt and still feel I can call you at any time, day or night, and you're there for me. The connection has played a big role in this change in me. Life is very different for me now. I'm married, working and happy helping rather than hurting people in the community. Adil and many others I work with are proof that when the correctional system works properly, those convicted of terror offences can be transformed into productive, peaceful members of society. But recently, some terrorists have slipped through the net. Usman Khan was out on license from prison when he staged a terror attack by London Bridge in November last year, killing two people and wounding three others. Two months later, Sadeh Shaman, who had been convicted of terror offences, was let out of prison on early release. A week later, he stabbed two members of the public on Streatham High Road. Both of them were meant to have been monitored and undergoing a process of rehabilitation. So what went wrong? I believe the government programme to oversee and de-radicalise terrorist act offenders is failing. Uh, the reason being is that we moved away from the face-to-face -face and the relationship building, which was so successful in the years, and because we've moved away, we're now putting people's lives at risk. That's not just my opinion. Key strategists involved in the government's original de-radicalisation and rehabilitation programme agree with me. I think there's an emphasis on technology. You know, we talk about the tags. They use GPS tags where they'll follow. You know, you can look at it um, on a computer screen. But actually, unless you talk to somebody, you don't know what's going on inside their mind. You don't know what they're thinking. Simon Cornwall is the originator of the former government program for moving convicted terrorists from prison into the community. I was the architect of the system that we put into place with an idea to de-radicalise people. Osman Khan, he's come down to London in my day, we would have had somebody with him. So we would have had a community group, a mentor, somebody who understood him. They would have been working with him for a few weeks. And they can, you know, when, you, when you're close to somebody, nobody does anything in isolation. You can see the change in them. You can feel that there's a change in what they're doing, why they're doing it. Even the way he's dressed or what he's got with him, you know, he will have had a tag on, but that tells you where he's been. It doesn't tell you where he's going or what he's going to do. So it's about having that relationship, that connection with him. But you can feel with that human interaction that you've built a relationship when things begin to go wrong. And you can use that to look at the rise in risk. And actually, we used to lock people back up in prison because we were worried about what they were doing. Moving away from providing mentoring and counselling and building relationships with terrorist act offenders is a step change for the worse, in my opinion, 
And on top of that, we've got hardly any real effective grassroots work to prevent young men and women from becoming radicalized in the first place. Three years ago, there was a fundamental shift in government strategy. Grassroots projects that were working effectively with young people at risk of radicalization were cut. I cannot understand you know, why we had to cut and change policy in such a way to put ourselves in danger. There are no places for kids to go to or individuals who are vulnerable to, to look up to. And I think that is the biggest loss because the challenge we have is that when individuals are being radicalized and individuals in the community identify that these individuals are radicalized, there's somewhere they could push them to. There's individuals they could give a call to say, listen, we have this individual, could you help us with? But there's no place, every place is locked up. International terrorist expert Temito Olodo has worked with the British government for many years, trying to extinguish the rising threat. He believes community centers and youth outreach and engagement projects are the key. How do you monitor individuals who have just come out of prison by just locking them up in, um, in an hostel where they are, they are with individuals that they don't know? You need a place where if these individuals come out of prison, they're moved and given into a community group where that community take ownership of them. You know, community, we own them, we we'll, we'll work with them, we we'll make sure that they become more valuable members of the community. And that is what we need to move back into if we want to really have serious change in our deradicalization project. The men who carried out the most recent attacks in London had both been released early from prison after being convicted of previous terror-related offences. The government now plans to ban the early release of such inmates in the future. But locking people up for longer with no hope of redemption could cause the resentment that enabled them to be radicalised in the first place to fester leading perhaps to even more attacks down the line. Legislation is legislation. If you want to do more and want to put stronger sentences on and you do it legally, I have no problem with that. I don't have a problem with people being in prison if they deserve it. But if you're going to keep them in prison, you need to do something with them. It's no good just locking people up and not doing anything with them. There needs to be an effort to rehabilitate and help people. We asked the Ministry of Justice to respond to the concerns raised in this film. A government spokesperson said, Every terrorist offender is monitored 24 hours a day using a GPS tag which tracks their movements. This is on top of regular face-to-face -face meetings with probation officers, police and other agencies. Extremism and terrorism are permanent and growing threats. The police and security services are doing the best they can in very difficult circumstances, but without effective and organically grown community-led counter-extremism programs, I fear that our fight against those who want to harm us is made far tougher.